Hello, my name's AJ Goldsby. I'm a life master from Pensacola, Florida, and I wanted to bring you today another video. And uh, this video is on a game of chess by Frederick or Friedrich Olofsson. He's an Icelandic grandmaster, and in 2010 he turned uh, 75, I believe it was. And uh, I did a webpage then on this chess game in 2010. However, I never made a video and a uh, fan of mine recently wrote me an email and said that I he gave me a whole list of games that I had annotated and he said any of these games he thought would make an excellent video and after a little preparation I decided I had to agree with him I mean some of these games are just not they're not great because I did a page on them or anything like that but they are great simply because they're great games of chess by great players and this game in particular I really like a lot so um, I thought we'd just go ahead and I would do a video on this game. I already have a web page on this game, and I will post the link for the web page in the little block just below the video where it says show more. In that area there, I can post the link to the web page. Uh, this game was a game that was played in Mar del Plata. Mar del Plata, just so you have some background, used to be one of the biggest uh, international tournaments of the year. Back then, Mar del Plata was one of the premier tournaments. If there were five or ten premier tournaments that were held every year back in the uh, you know that particular time period then Mar del Plata would have had to have been one of the best ones um, but it white was uh, Frederick Olofsson and black was Eric Gottlieb Eliskasis or Eliskasis E-L-I-S-K-A-S-E-S -E -E and anyway both were very strong players you know grandmaster players but anyway uh, Olofsson was white Eliskasis was black or Eliskasis was black and it was played in Mar del Plata in round 10 in 1960. So without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get into the game. It starts off E4, C6, 2, D3. I think you, I used to wonder who started the uh, King's Indian attack stuff. And it probably turns out that probably one of the, well, several players played it. Tall did it and uh, several of the Soviets did it. But probably the biggest person, if you want to blame one person, was uh, Bobby Fischer. He had tremendous success and played some unbelievably brilliant games using the King's Indian attack. And also he published my book, which was also very popular uh, back in the 1960s. It was called My 60 Memorable Games. So he had a lot of imitators. And uh, there were several games with the King's Indian attack in that book. But anyway, this is a game that starts off to D3 and basically White's playing a King's Indian attack versus a Karo Khan. Black plays 2d5, knight d2, knight d7, knight gf3, queen c7, g3, d takes e4, d takes e4, e5, bishop g2, bishop to c5. And of course, this is a very good developing move by Black. It's just pointing the, the bishop along this dark square diagonal. You know, Black can expand on the queen side, play moves like b5 and a5, and queen b6, so this square could become a real problem for White. Uh, probably an alternative there would be uh, not just the simple knight gf6 rather than bishop c5. In other words, just placing the knight on g8 to f6. That would have been a fairly decent alternative to bishop c5 there. Black castles, 97, b3, knight g6, bishop b2. Black castles, I'm sorry, white castles. Let's back up just a little bit. White castle here on this move. White castle, black played 97 b3, knight g6, bishop b2, and now black castle. And now white played a3 and black played a5. Obviously white was thinking possibly about playing b4, hitting this bishop and gaining some space with a gain of time. And that's why white, you know, black prevented it with a5. And uh, I'm just going to basically go through this game rather quickly. I'm going to concentrate on the, uh, the, the tough parts. As I've already said, I have a web page on this game and also I'll on the web page, there will be a post now to some revised analysis. I took a few days and, and uh, checked it with several engines and revised my analysis and analyzed a few things. And it's in PDF form, so you can open it immediately and look at it and analyze it all you want to. And you can print it out and study it. You have my permission to do that. By all means, do that. That's why it's there. So I'm because I have so much other material on this game, I'm not going to spend a lot of time like analyzing the game looking at different possibilities and you know looking at the open and whatnot because I think my webpage 
and my uh, uh, printed analysis, which I posted on the web in PDF form, Adobe format form, uh, takes care of all that quite adequate, adequately. But anyway, I'm just going to go through the game, and we will look at the, the, uh, the, some of the interesting things that could have happened later. But anyway, black, white plays 91. I think that move has several important points. The most important point is a white can play f4, and then the knight comes to the d3 square with a gain of time. Because I don't think in this particular position, black really wants to lose his dark squared bishop for white's knight. b6. Uh, that move I'm not real sure about. The b6 move, you know, black could have done a lot of different things. I thought if I were black, I might play something like bishop a7, and that way my my dark squared bishop is always on that diagonal pointed at squares at or near the white king. And uh, I'm not sure exactly why black played b6 there. It'd be interesting, actually, just to fire up an engine here. Just really quickly, I'll fire up Fritz 13, and we'll see what Fritz shows here. Fritz is liking bishop to d4 at this point. I'm going to go ahead and cut Fritz off because I have no interest in, in just letting it run. Bishop d4 also is another good move. Looks to exchange off that you know, white star, dangerous star square bishop. But I mean, I guess there was a number of different things that, that black could have done. Uh, b6 obviously solidifies his position and also allows the, the light square bishop to come out on a6. So anyway, that's what black played. Knight d3. Bishop a6, there's a nice pin there on the a6 f1 diagonal. This knight can't move without dropping a rook there or dropping an exchange on f1. Knight f3, bishop to d6. Here black willingly withdrew his bishop. Probably a slightly better move was maybe just bishop takes d3 or, or the rook on f to d8. Anyway, black played bishop to d6. White played h4. Here black played rfe8, just putting a, a rook in the center. White plays h5, that kicks that knight on g6. Knight gf8. Knight h4, that's a, that's a good move. I like that move a lot. Uh, basically, the main idea there is to get a knight to the f5 outpost, and then the queen can come here, and, and then you start seeing uh, several pieces start ganging up on the black king, and that's one of the main ideas of the king's Indian attack, is I've seen good players play it, and usually when they play it, usually what happens is sooner or later, uh, you know, they're able to, you know, close the position, avoid exchanges, and then transfer their pieces over to the king side and try to attack the black king. I think that's what the allure of the king's Indian attack is. And many players, you know, many masters have used that line, especially against lines like the French and the Karo Khan, which probably for a lot of masters, uh, I've had trouble with those lines. And I'm sure every other king pawn player, at, at least at one time, has had trouble against the French and the Karo Khan and has probably thought about an alternative something that was easier to play or something that you know didn't inquire, require learning all the lines that black already knows you know that kind of thing so anyway black plays white plays knight h4 black plays knight c5 knight f5 knight takes d3 c takes d3 black plays knight e6 this is a good move just redirecting the knight and also looking at the d4 and f4 squares white plays queen g4 this is the first sign of an attack beginning of an attack very nice move now black's got a, basically, you know, there's threats of like knight takes g7. Right now, the primary tactical threat, that's what I always tell my students, is that you always have to look for the primary tactical threat. In other words, that's the, the move that would probably hurt you the most or what the main idea here. And one main idea for white is knight takes, knight takes h6. And black might actually be getting in, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Black might actually get it, be getting in trouble there. So I think it's very important there for black to put a stop to that, maybe f6 or even g6 here. So anyway, queen g4, that's, you know, the, and it appears to hang a pawn here, but after one of these rooks coming to d1 square like rfd1, then white gets a lot of play for the attack. Black plays f6. That's just solidifying the king side, fortifying e5, and also now the queen, as well as the knight, guards the g7 square. White plays f4, x-clan. White's starting a very sharp plan. He obviously intends to try to rip open the uh, f-file here. And uh, that's ob obviously a good idea for white. And black plays red8. This is probably a critical position here. 
Um, the, all the engines seem to indicate that Black is okay up to this point. None of his moves have been even bad or even terrible. I mean, all of his moves have been more or less playable up to this point. But at this particular point, this is where Black could have definitely improved. Probably the best move here was either Bishop takes d3 or Fritz 13 and Houdini's uh, suggestion of Bishop c5 check. So one of those two moves might have been a little bit better than what was played in the game. Here Black plays rad8. That just simply seems to be like a normal, legitimate you know, move centralizing the rooks and getting all your pieces developed. Uh, it turns out that that was a, a bad move in retrospect, that that was not a good move. And one of the really curious things that about that move was it basically the reason it was bad and I mean you have to have you know you have to think like a computer and real or really know everything that's going to happen in this game but one of the reasons that that move was so bad was because it took away one of the last flight squares for the black king the black king is actually going to want that square as a flight square in a few moves so anyway but um, you know some improvements there were uh, bishop takes d3 e takes f4 or bishop c5 check but anyway, black played R A D eight. Now white, you know, starts opening lines. F takes E five. Bishop takes E five. And this is where I thought, you know, basically that I thought when I first went over this game that, you know, white had to be fine here. But this is where the sparks really start flying. And also too, this was a problem of the day for the uh, chess games website uh, for Sunday, June twenty seventh, uh, two thousand and ten. So this is, you know, a really great little game of chess. I had seen this game before because I forget who it was, but someone had a game. It was Olofsson's best games, or you know, it was it was covered in that in that book, and I had seen this game in that book before. But still, this is a great, great little um, uh, chess problem and a great, great position, and a great chess game. But here, White plays Knight H6, X Clam. King's got to go to F8. Going in the corner gets Black in trouble. Just very briefly, if King H8, then takes takes Knight there check. And you know White's going to win the exchange here. He's going to win the rook on on d8. So that's probably would qualify as an unplayable line. So after knight h6 check, the king had to go to f8. And now there's more fireworks. This is where things you know really get sticky. White's got two pieces hanging, and he, you know he sacrifices a piece. Rook takes f6, double x clown. Just a brilliant, brilliant move. Brilliant. Um, play, you know, it was played in 1960s, so computers weren't even a factor back then. Uh, chess engines hadn't even been developed yet. In fact, the home PC had not been invented yet, so this was long before any of, of those developments played a role in chess. And so, you know, this is just a wonderful move to be a grandmaster. To be able to play this, and, and Olofsson was, when he was young, was quite the, quite the good calculator. In fact, one time he was easily in the top 25 players in the world, maybe close to even being the top 10 in the world. I mean, he tied for first in several large tournaments over the years and maybe is one of the greatest players to ever come out of the little chess-playing uh, island of Iceland. But uh, anyway, uh, this is just a great move, very brilliant move. Rook takes f6. Black has to take. Bishop takes f6. Some of the bad, bad things that can happen to black are just one bad thing that can happen. Black is if g takes f6, queen check, check, knight f5 check, d4 check, king b5, and now bishop f1's mate. That's just one possible line there. So obviously you can see here how in this particular line when the king was on e7, if his king had to the d8 square, it wouldn't be flushed out into the open. It wouldn't have to come out this way. So that shows you why the, the rook d8 move turned out to be such a bad idea. But anyway, white's 24th move is rook takes f6 check, double x lamb, bishop takes, bishop takes and now he might as well play g takes f6 i mean again i have a web page where i analyze everything and if you're really interested in analyzing everything you can always visit the web page and uh, on the web page i have my analysis there in pdf format you can print that out and study this game from that source as well so if you want to do all that you can go ahead but anyway bishop takes f6 probably here the best line for black according to computers was bishop to d3 queen f5 and I give a, a long line there, and you can just go through that in, in the uh, when you study the, the analysis. But anyway, after bishop takes f6, black plays g takes f6. And I think probably at this point, everything is losing for black anyway. And again, I would refer you to my you know, webpage and my PDF analysis. So anyway, queen g8 check, 
king e7. Queen takes h7 check. Again, very nice little move. King d6. And now here's another little chess problem. In fact, I'm going to stop talking for just a few seconds here for about five or ten seconds. And maybe you can try to guess what you know white's next move is. And I think long before going back, let's just go back a few moves here. Back in this position here, probably right about now, white was already thinking about the sacrifices that were coming up, and he would have had to already calculate, in my opinion, you know, the the results of these sacrifices before playing his 21st move. But anyway, check here. When the king gets to the d6 square, in this position, I'm going to stop talking for just a second, for a few seconds, and I'd like you to pause the video if you want to. You can pause the video and try to figure out you know what the correct move for white is because this is another look nice little problem and obviously the engines come up with the answer instantly but figuring this out with humans I took this to chess club one night and no one at my chess club came close to even getting it right and I've shown it at a few tournaments as well and again a lot of players unless their players are really strong like a, a master or title player most of the time they don't get this one as well so if, I'll stop talking for just a little bit for about five or ten seconds and if you like you can Pause the video and try to figure out what the best move for white is. Okay, if you did as I asked, hopefully you paused the video and you tried to figure out what the best move for white is and, and don't feel bad if you didn't get it right. But it's an interesting little problem. It's basically another white to move and win. The move is E5 check. I give that an X clam because it's just it's incredible in all its ramifications. One of the reasons he's got to take back with a pawn, well, he could take back with a pawn, but um, uh, we'll just look at that very briefly. F takes e5, knight f5 check, king there, rook c1 check there, rook takes c4, bishop takes c6, king a6, bishop b5 check, king takes b5, rook takes c7, knight takes c7, queen takes c7. And this is just a one game for white, if rook takes d3, simply queen c4 uh, check, and, and you know black loses a rook. So in this position, black is just completely busted. White has both a material advantage and, a, and an overwhelming attack as well. In fact, the threat right now is simply mate in one with queen c4. So anyway, that's a, just an interesting position here. So anyway, but in this game, white played e5 check. And again, if you want to see all the different moves, I've analyzed pretty much everything on my webpage and in my PDF analysis, so you can simply check that if you're really curious. But anyway, e5 check, black plays king takes e5, d4 check, rook takes d4. Again, that was forced, and again, I'll refer you to my analysis. I'm not going to analyze every single possibility because I don't want this video to go too long, but it's still a very interesting line. Knight f7 check, that was forced, by the way. Black had to play queen takes f7 there. If he didn't play that, uh, he very winds up very quickly getting mated, such as, uh, let's see, I guess he can't play. No, I guess he has to play that. The king's completely cut off. The king has no flight squares. F4 is covered by the pawn. F5, E4 covered by the queen and bishop. D5 is coined by the bishop. D6. So here, black has to, to uh, sack his queen. He has to take because he has no other legal moves. I mean, that's the only other move. So it would be checkmate if the queen wasn't on, wasn't able to capture the knight. So queen takes f7, queen takes f7, rd, d8. Now black's just trying to regroup and get rid of the hangers. Rook e1 check, queen to f, uh, king to d6, king's got to back up. Queen takes f6, bishop c8. Here black could have gotten away from the tack and got out of the pin, but he would have just dropped his knight, and that would have been hopeless too. But bishop c8, queen e5 check, king d7, bishop takes h3. And here Aliscuses or Aliscuses. Uh, as uh, Ilioscuses is caught in a very damaging pin here, and he's going to lose another piece. So here Black resigns. And that pretty much does it for my video of this game. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful game of chess. I encourage you to study it. Um, much happens in this game. It's a tremendous bunch of tactics, uh, you know, a lot of different ideas, you know, and a study of this game will certainly make you a better player. And uh, if you would like to um, make a donation. If you appreciate my web pages and my videos and would like to make a donation, please go to the PayPal website. That's www.paypal.com. 
P-A-Y-P-A-L.com and make a donation there. My uh, handle or my uh, account that you make a donation is LifeMasterAJ at Yahoo.com. And, of course, if you have a comment on the video or on my webpage, you'd like to make a comment, I'd like to hear about that as well. So drop me a line. Again, my email is LifeMasterAJ at Yahoo.com. I thank you for watching my video, and I hope you have a great day.